Hi, I'm author Amy Shannon, and this is Storytelling with Amy Shannon. A lot of my stories that I've been telling, some are memories and real life experiences, and some are from stories that I've written, and most of those have been published. A few of the stories that I may tell during my series may, um, may never be published, um, but hopefully um, people will know that they are my stories and they came from my imagination. I've been going through a hard time personally lately and and I'm one to kind of analyze and try to figure out why what's going on and one of the things that um, I never wanted it to define me. Um, I am a survivor of domestic violence and my um, ex-husband, who's since have he's since have passed away. Um, the last day of the last day that I um, that we lived in the same house, I should say, um, he tried to kill me. That um, experience is something that I don't share very much with a lot of people. I mean, some people know the basics. Um, truth is, I'm, after 14 years, it's, it still haunts me, even when half my brain says, you know, get over it. It's something that you probably don't ever get over. That experience also has changed my perspective on a lot of things, and including myself, and how I looked at myself, and how... Not only with what happened to me, affected others around me and how they acted. So I wanted to kind of share my experience. And if if you've ever had this problem, um, I just warning that um, anything I may say with this story could be a trigger for someone. Um, I'm dedicating this, um, this particular story to anyone who suffers at the hand, hands of abuse or has suffered or knows someone who is. Um, I used to think, just get out, you know, do what you can. And it's not always easy. Sometimes people ask for help and they don't get it. Sometimes people are very good at hiding what they're really feeling and what's even on the outside. And some abusers are really good about making sure that the marks are where clothes can cover. Um, and bumping into a wall and falling down the stairs is always a good excuse that people may use. This is for people who think they have to hide or think they have to remain quiet. On November 2nd, 2005, when I woke up that morning, I felt like it was going to be any ordinary day, except I had been struggling with my marriage. Um, it had been struggling for a while, um, but we thought we could work through it as we've done in other problems in our, our marriage. We were together for 13 years, married for five. Together we have three sons. That day, it was around four o'clock in the afternoon and I had come home from paying a bill and I immediately started to make lunches for my children's school the next day. It was just what I did. My husband came behind me and asked me what I was doing and I didn't turn around. I said I was making lunches and he called me an effing liar. And I said, no, I, you, 
it was very obvious that exactly what I was doing was making lunches. And then he called me an effing liar again. And he grabbed me by my ponytail and he knocked me off my feet and dragged me into the living room. For about 45 minutes, he kept attacking me and coming at me. I tried to both defend myself and protect myself, but then I just got so tired of doing both. So I did whatever I could to protect myself. He used his fist, and when he got tired, he slammed my head against the wall or the floor. At one point, I was knocked unconscious, and when I regained consciousness, I woke up to him kicking me in my side and in my head, telling me to stop faking. At some point, and I don't remember a lot of what had happened, he had grabbed me enough with enough force to rip my bra from my body. So I was wearing a thin gray t-shirt and blue jeans. And at the time I was a smoker and I was, I didn't think about it before, but I was really glad later that I had left my cigarettes and my lighter in my pocket. And I'll get to that in a few moments. He started to get tired, but then he saw my purse on the floor and he dumped it upside down. He opened my wallet and swore that the picture of him I had in my wallet was some other man and that I was cheating on him. So what he kind of showed is paranoia. At another point, he tried to act like he didn't know who I was because at that point my face was unrecognizable. I looked like I was wearing a, a scary Halloween monster mask. Um, when I told him I was his wife and please don't stop hurting me, he called me a liar and tried to rip my face off. But then he focused on, um, I had some papers, a manuscript that I had been working on, um, and he knew that was something important to me. So he picked up all those papers and he shredded them and threw them around the room. So I knew when he was trying to say that he didn't know who I was, that he indeed knew exactly who I was. It was at that moment that I realized I didn't love this man anymore and he obviously did not love me. And I don't know why he stopped. At um, another point, just when I thought I had no more strength left. He told me to go over to him. I was sitting on the couch and he was sitting in his recliner and I refused, I didn't, I didn't move. I could barely move. Um, parts of me were numb and parts of me just ached all over. And so he got out of his chair, he grabbed me by my hair and pulled me over to the recliner and he sat down pulling me onto his lap. He was just too tired so he decided to just kill me because he was too lazy to keep hitting me. He looked me in the eye and this is a man who had beautiful blue eyes and all I saw was red and hate. It the way he looked at me, I knew that the man that I loved and, and married and spent the last 13 years with and fa had fathered my children wasn't there anymore. He wrapped his hands around my throat and told me that I was going to die tonight and he was going to be the one to kill me. And he said, no matter where you go, heaven or hell, you'll never get me out of your head. 
and he started and he squeezed harder and harder I could feel myself fading away as I struggled to breathe but the, but then they say that you know if you're having a near-death experience sometimes your life flashes before your eyes but in my case my death flashed before my eyes I could picture myself dead on my living room floor and having my sons find me and then I could picture my husband with a shovel and me flipped over his shoulder look, wandering the woods for you know one of those unknown burials and nobody ever finds you and then I flashed back to my children finding me dead and I could not allow that to happen I could not them I could not have them see their mother beaten to death by their father so somehow I got the strength and I raised my foot up as hard as I could and I kicked him in the head and he instantly let go of my neck and then I used the same foot to like push myself onto the floor kind of like catapulting myself under the floor and then I ran now I'm not a runner but I was running for my life and I ran through my long kitchen and as I was running out the door I locked the door behind me that way if he when he chased after me it would you know give me a few seconds and I did the same thing with the breezeway and then I just ran and ran and ran and as I'm running I thought I heard our truck start up so I hid in the bushes until it got dark because I was afraid that either he or his friend who was staying with us and had walked in the middle of it and saw what he was doing to me and turned around and left he didn't even call for help he just ignored it um, I thought they were some one of them was going to come out looking for me so I stayed hidden in the bushes until it was dark and I didn't even have my glasses and I need glasses to see because I can't see farther than a few inches in front of my face some have asked me why I didn't go to neighbors for help and I was just afraid that if he or his friend saw me trying to get help from a neighbor or a stranger that that person would be in danger as well I had no idea what to expect and I thought I could get help right away my children I thought they were outside playing in the yard turns out later that each of them saw different parts of what happened to me and it affected them five hours later after cutting through woods and backyards and hiding when I would hear a car or a truck drive by I made my way to the local state troopers barracks and just as I got to their back door I had collapsed and I don't know how long it was till one of them had found me and they saved me and they went and got my children and they arrested my husband I spent eight days in the hospital and I thought the system would work for me people who talked to me assumed that I would go back to them that I would drop charges or that I would blame myself I didn't blame myself because I knew whatever I was doing I I was making lunches for my children so that was no reason to try to kill me I wasn't I didn't have a, a smart mouth I, we weren't in the middle of a fight but even if all those things were true even if I called them a name which I didn't I never did 
something that that act those actions don't deserve what he did to me and then he was in jail for a while and the justice system was kind of ups and downs and I needed help from people at higher levels than me just being an ordinary ordinary citizen that was a survivor of a violent assault it took I had to get a lot of people behind me and and help me get justice and some points I had to I met up with a legislator um, for the county I lived in she helped me with press conferences to kind of fix what was wrong with the system and how long it took but he was rearrested after I told my story to the grand jury and it was the system that I felt was failing me and just kind of like hurting me all over again but in the end it, it worked out the state troopers that I that helped me they did everything right the local police department did everything right it was somehow trying them trying to figure out if it was a misdemeanor or a felony charge and then the files getting misplaced and things not working but eventually because I kept pushing and I was able to get people to push with me he went to prison and was supposed to have parole for seven years after eventually he got out of prison and nine months after he got out of prison he passed away and when he those nine months that he was out we were we, we had to be hidden even when he was in prison we, we had to, to kind of keep where we were quiet so you know um, I had to do things with forwarding mail and when I moved to from place to place I would make sure it wasn't on a main street it was kind of in the back somewhere but I also wanted him to know that I wasn't afraid of him anymore even that day it wasn't fear it was part of it was not understanding and it wasn't fear because of what he was doing it was that I would die and my children would suffer after my ordeal and then when it became public knowledge people that I knew backed away from me without saying a word people didn't know what to say so they didn't say anything at all and not even an occasional hello then there was those that pitied me and I don't like being pitied you know any bet anything that happens we just work through it and then there were those that thought I should have been stronger and not have allowed him to do something like that to me and then there were people that I didn't know praised me for surviving and, and fighting with justice um, years later I wrote a book called Fractured Tears a struggle with justice and it's a fictionalized version of my story and what happened to me and the the basically the hoops I had to go through to get justice and without all said and done and he was punished and he tried to blame every everything and everybody but himself it's been 14 years over 14 years and it still haunts me he still haunts me he comes in my 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 dreams 
as even a, just a background character. He'll invade. Dreams, I think, are going well. Sometimes I'll have a reminder of something. It took a long time for me to remember our memories before this happened as anything but terrible. Eventually I got past that. I tried to share with my children the man he was before that. He wasn't always easy to deal with. And some people would say that I was the only one that could deal with him. And one thing, he didn't like to be the bad guy or the heavy. And he didn't like it if I was mad at him. And when I was sick and I had cancer, he took care of me. And I think he was very overprotective because he thought that he would lose me. And I don't think even he foresaw that a year later he would try to be the one to end my life. I know this is one of my longer stories. I think it's important if someone is in this situation do what you can to help them even if it's just listening. And I must say that it doesn't always work to go to law enforcement for help. But there are programs and places people can just talk to, um, even anonymously, try to get ideas on, on, on how to be help, how to get help. Unfortunately, a lot of times the one who's abuser is the, in charge of the finances. Um, that wasn't my case, but he did take a lot of money that I had earned. Um, but things change, and since that day, I've had the same headache, and over the years it's gotten worse and worse. I have one every single day, and as it got worse, It would add more symptoms because the brain is an anomaly and I had six concussions. And so it affects my daily living. And even the last six months or so, my health has gotten worse. Some of my headaches and I've had other symptoms and I'm just trying to push through every day and fight the demons that keep haunting me. I'm sorry this has been like one of those downers, but if you know someone who is in trouble, sometimes all you have to do is listen. Don't try to tell them what to do, but maybe help them figure out what they can do to help themselves. It's not always easy to get out. But if you don't, you could be dead. And just unless there's a huge fight involved, domestic violence cases are not reported on the news unless someone is dead. They're not, the arrests aren't in the paper unless it's part of a police blotter or someone like me decided to go against the district attorney in order to make him work my case. So sometimes all you have to do is listen and actually hear what the person needs because what you might think they need is not necessarily what they need and each situation is different so if you know someone who is in trouble do what you can just by being there and lending a hand this has been Amy Shannon and storytelling with Amy Shannon and I hope you continue to listen to more of my stories goodbye for now